Battleforce 2000 was Hasbro's first attempt at a sub-series of G.I. Joe. Originally called Future Force, this six-vehicle, six-driver team of Joes were tasked with testing high-tech prototype vehicles under battlefield conditions and to support the regular G.I. Joe team. The vehicles could split into two separate units, a main vehicle and a small battle station. All six smaller battle stations could then combine into one medium-sized base called the Future Fortress, a name probably left over from the original design. The only media that this sub-team appeared in, apart from animated commercials, was the old Marvel Comics run of G.I. Joe, first appearing in issue 68. Their final appearance is in issue number 113, where all but one member is killed. Most collector sites list the entire first series of Battle Force 2000 as a 1987 release, but the truth is a bit more complicated than that. For part one of my series on Battle Force 2000, I'm going to be taking a look at the hovercraft, Vindicator, and its pilot, Blaster, and the snow tank, the Dominator, and its pilot, Avalanche. First, let's take a look at the Dominator. It has skids, or skis, at four corners of the vehicle, meaning that's its propulsion, but they don't move up or down. They're not really positionable in that way. They do move side to side, but that's really for the gimmick of this vehicle. On the front, we do have swiveling front cannons. They obviously don't swivel all the way around because then they would hit the turret. The turret itself can move all the way around. And the main cannon can move up and down. As a matter of fact, the cannon actually does have some ratcheting in there, but mine is really kind of loose. Oddly enough, it still holds a position anyway. On the turret, of course, we have a canopy for the figure. And the figure can sit really deep in there, as he is right now. And the cover can close right over his head. Fully. On each side of the vehicle, we also have these opening hatches to show detail. There's one on each side, but more prominently than that, we can see the lock and unlock detail. And that's something which is actually on all of the Battle Force 2000 vehicles. And as you can see here, we have two foot pegs on one side and two on the other. And now for the Dominator's second mode. As you can see on the front, it has a very sleek, very sharp front end. But that's all kind of broken up by this locking tab here. There's actually one on the bottom. So once you split those apart very carefully, like so, you keep opening it up. And the outer part is just a shell. Keep opening that up until you have the mini tank inside. You just rotate the guns forward because they were kind of uh, squished together inside the shell. Now you can fully see the wheels on the bottom of this armored fighting vehicle, whereas you can only kind of just see them popping out of the bottom of the Dominator shell. And obviously these roll quite a bit better without the friction added by the skids. On the back here, we have a universal tow hook for any towed weapon system that you might want to carry on with this. And two foot pegs for two extra figures on here. Obviously the turret and the cannon itself is just the same as it would be on the Dominator. As well as the position for the figure, which I'll just take out for right now. Added to this are two tiny little guns, which we had before, and they rotate all the way around. As well as two panels here, and again, the lock-unlock detail. Removing these panels, you can see some type of cylindrical detail on here. I'm not sure if these are missiles or shells or something. And on the other one, 
we have little grenades sculpted in. Now after removing the inner vehicle, you actually have a couple of options, although there is only one or two actual official options to do with this. The unofficial option is actually just to put it back together again and just use it as a shell. You can put whatever you want in here. Maybe another vehicle if you have that. If you have something, well, you know, small enough to fit in here. This is, after all, quite, quite hollow. But what you're supposed to do is supposed to split it up and split it out further. All the way sideways like this. You're supposed to rotate the skids up, then push them in to lock them into place. Unfortunately, mine are a little bit warped, so it's a little bit hard to get them underneath this ridge sometimes. But once they actually do fit in and lock into place, they lock quite firmly. And now what you have is an emplacement wall. You can actually just put some figures behind it for cover. And there you go. It's like a little mini trench. Now, I know that seems a little bit lame, and I'm not going to lie to you, it is. Next, we'll take a look at the Dominator's driver, Avalanche. He comes with two accessories. The first being a rather large microphone plugged into the side of his helmet. And he comes with what the contents list on his car refers to a P-480 Sub-Zero Stun Gun. I think this may actually be the first stun gun in the G.I. Joe line. Which is very odd because we actually do get some military policemen who could use some non-lethal weapons, but oh well. It says Sub-Zero, but I'm not sure if it's supposed to shoot out some type of freeze ray or whether it's just something that works in sub-zero temperatures. I have to admit, I actually do like Avalanche quite a bit. Now I know, I know it, uh, <laughs> I really like a lot of the G.I. Joe Arctic figures, but I really do honestly like this guy. Sure, his outfit is a bit sci-fi, but that's kind of the appeal of this guy anyway. Especially that ridge on the helmet. That's a very classic kind of Buck Rogers kind of a look to it. One thing I do have to say is I kind of wish they went with a different color other than this type of brown which they used on his camouflage. Honestly, it makes him look like, well, he looks a little bit dirty, let's just put it that way. However, it is nice that they've picked out almost all of his detail out in the silver paint here. Especially whatever is going on on his shoulder here, it's like a big little armored shoulder patch or pauldron or something. Honestly, with this little bit right here, it kind of reminds me of like a Arctic Judge Dread. He's also wearing what almost looks like silver cowboy boots. It's a very odd design. And while it doesn't have any paint on the back, I'm actually glad that it doesn't because it actually kind of detracts from the whole cowboy look and kind of makes it look like they are supposed to be uh, something which just happened to look like that way. But one very interesting thing which isn't picked out in silver or brown is this gray thing on the side of his leg, which for all intents and purposes look like nunchucks. Now, I don't know why an Arctic guy would be carrying around nunchucks, but on the other hand, I don't see why not. It actually does give him a bit of personality if that is indeed what they're supposed to be. And speaking of those, I guess, nunchucks, that is the subject of the variant of this figure. Because here is another avalanche figure, and you can clearly see that they've cheaped out and went with the same silver that they've used for the rest of the figure on this one. And I hate to admit it, but the lighter application of silver on this, I guess the cheapening version of this figure, actually means that you can see the detail of this thing better, and it definitely looks, looks like nunchucks just strapped to the side of his leg. The avalanche with the grey paint detail on his leg was issued first, so he only ever existed on a single card. However, they also transitioned from grey to silver on this card, 
So you'll only find the silver versions on the two packs. It looks like at some point in the design stage, Avalanche would have had a clear visor across part of his face. And speaking of the card, you can see there are a few differences between the single card on the one which came on the double pack. Here the artwork is actually reversed from the way it's supposed to be. And if you just have these things loose and you're wondering whether it came from a single pack or a double pack, the single pack file cars just have the uh, their driver and the name of the vehicle, whereas the double packs actually tell you what the vehicle was meant to do. In this case it was a snow vehicle. If you're looking for a Dominator or an Avalanche or most likely both on the aftermarket, there are a few things that you do have to look out for. And one of them is obviously the plastic quality on the Dominator. Now, the Dominator was never supposed to be bright white like the figure. It always had a touch of cream to it. And well, as you can see, mine has darkened quite a bit, but I'm not really that fussed about putting it in hydrogen peroxide just to raise it two levels up in brightness. Uh, it looks just fine to me. But of course, it's up against a white background, so it probably looks a little bit worse than it does to the naked eye. There is, of course, the other thing that um, a lot of a lot of sellers and dealers actually uh, sell this thing and photograph it all closed up. So you do have to make sure that the inner vehicle has all its little parts, like the panels and of course the guns and even the bumper. Of course, the one biggest thing often missing on Dominators on the aftermarket is of course the antenna, the bane of all G.I. Joe collectors to be perfectly honest. Although none of the Battle Force 2000 vehicles or figures are particularly uh, sought after by collectors, so you will quite, find, quite frankly find them very easily on the aftermarket, all of the parts, and for a very cheap price. And that includes the antenna, whether it's attached to the vehicle or not. As a separate part, it is actually rather large. It's not two separate antennas, but two joined at the base here. So this isn't a very well, it's not a very easy part to lose. And of course, there's the figure. The figure being white plastic, it is subject to a bit of discoloration himself, but he is supposed to be bright white, and you can restore him with hydrogen peroxide rather easily. Of course, there is the tiny little microphone on the side of his head, which is fairly easy to uh, find on the aftermarket just by itself. Again, microphones are usually quite hard to find for uh, G.I. Joe figures, but of course, we're talking about a figure which really nobody really wants. Next, we'll take a look at the Vindicator Hovercraft. It has two rather large seats, unencumbered by back pegs or seat belts, which honestly action figures really don't need. And they certainly don't need it in this vehicle. Despite it being rather open, it actually cups figures really well in there. We also have joysticks on either side of the seats. The cockpit itself is pretty much symmetrical, so you can have a driver on left or right if you so choose. As for armaments, this thing does have rather long guns here, which will all the way around, as you can see. The vehicle is rather long thanks to this really long tail boom, almost like a helicopter. And it has guns on here as well, which can swivel all the way around. You can have them forward, up, down, whatever. I think most people actually point them backwards because that's how it's shown on the package. And of course, you have a bit of defense from attacks from the rear. Underneath, we actually do have some missiles here, which actually do poke out. But I'm actually going to get to that a bit later. And of course, also poking out from the bottom is a universal tow hook. One very interesting thing is because it's a hovercraft, it is of course a fan driven vehicle and we have fans which actually do rotate. Really cool. But not only do they spin, the housings themselves actually turn. So you can actually fold them all the way around like this. And that is the same on the back one as well. And finally, we have a removable engine cowling, which shows off a bit of the engine detail, 
which isn't really all that necessary because that detail kind of extends out all along the boom. And now for the Vindicator second mode. You notice that we have a black shifter in the control column here. Pushing it all the way back towards the seats locks the cargo underneath in place. However, pushing it forward detaches it and deploys it. Now, in order for the Vindicator as a whole vehicle to actually roll around on the ground, relies on the cargo being attached because it has the wheels on the bottom. With it detached like this, all we have are these little nubbins on the bottom here. Unlike the Dominator, the Vindicator actually does have detail underneath the vehicle. And you can see right here, that's the locking point. I'm just actuating the lever from the other side there. And now to transform the cargo into the rocket sled. To do that, we pull this panel up. And then pull this section up so that the arm bit here is straight. And then we can just rotate these panels up top around if we so desire. They can be backward or forward if you like because they're now a radar screen. And we have four accessible rockets, two on either side, two large seats once again. That panel what we have is a highly detailed screen. And we again have access to the universal tow hook. To put the rocket sled back into the Vindicator main vehicle is rather simple. You just have to fold the radar arm down like that, down into the portion right behind the tow hook. Now you can either leave the radar screens facing forward, but I like flipping them around so that it's all nice and flush like that. And then of course you just push the radar screen back in and you just push them together and you can actually hear it clicking into place, but you can always push this thing a bit back just to secure it in place. I really love how the rocket sled was released from the main Vindicator vehicle via that lever, which is so well integrated into the control column that it looks like the figure could have pulled it back himself to release it. It's little engineering touches like this which really endear me to the entire G.I. Joe line and certainly endeared me to this particular toy. Unfortunately, we got that little gimmick at the expense of two other things. We lost the budget on the Vindicator's windshield. Now, as you can see, there's actually a little hole here, and that's not just you know to put the vehicle together or to lock the rocket sled in place. That was actually meant for a post for a clear plastic wraparound windshield, which we just didn't get. You can still see it on the photograph on the back of the box, unfortunately, which is quite a tease. Another tease is the fact that the rockets actually don't move. They're just pegged in. And as you can see, the rockets have a peg which is far back on the actual main body of the rocket, meaning that at some point, these pegs would have actually have swiveled and they're far back on here so that they can actually clear the bottom of the thing when it swivels upwards. You can still see it on the instructions and blueprints for, well, most of the Balforce 2000 vehicles where this thing is angled up. Blaster, the Vindicator hovercraft pilot, came with two accessories. The first being his face mask. And he came with a weapon which is called, on the contents list of the card, a DK-528 Infragreen Laser Pistol. For those of you who know what Infragreen really means, you're probably laughing your heads off. But I'm pretty sure that the copywriters back in 1987 would have meant for this to be a Kind of an advanced version of infrared, the wavelength of light. Of course, this being a laser pistol, it uses light to shoot at things. So it kind of makes sense from that perspective. Unfortunately, infra green is really just a short form for 
urban infrastructure greenery. Basically, uh, an example of this would be when you see a skyscraper, but it has like a, a layer of grass or trees on the very rooftop, that's infrastructure greenery or infra-green. You're adding an oxygenating atmosphere to an otherwise completely urban area or environment. I don't mind the looks of Blaster here, even if he is kind of generic looking, but at least he is the only of the Battle Force 2000 figures to actually have some army green on him. I mean, sure, it's really only his boots and his chest plate here. The rest of his green outfit is a little bit on the bright side, but it still goes really well with what he's got. He does have some webbing here on his waist and on his legs here, even though it doesn't seem to be attached to anything, nor is he type, any type of mountain climber or parachutist, so I'm not quite sure what's going on there with that detail. Unfortunately, we do have the missing paint up of having red on the top of his uh, hat there. It's just all blue on the figure. But one very, very interesting thing, however, is you can see that his shirt actually goes all the way down. It's, it's a long sleeve shirt connected to his gloves. You can see those middle portions are just some type of blue armband. However, on the figure, as you can see, they've made those armbands the cut off sleeves and they've made the rest of his just kind of open. And it's clearly not supposed to be that way because you can see that on the flesh tone part of his lower arm here are cloth wrinkles. So this should have been green all the way down, but for some strange reason, they went the extra touch and just made this a flash tone. Even on the Brazilian version, which actually uses brand new artwork for the figure, they've still managed to cover up the arms. However, at least the Brazilian version has colored in his offset gloves, his right glove being black on the Brazilian version, whereas the US version kept both of them blue for some reason. If you're looking for a Vindicator or a Blaster, or both on the aftermarket, like I said before, all Battle Force 2000 vehicles are very cheap and very affordable on the aftermarket. They're just not very hot with collectors, at least not right now. I do have to say that the Rocket Sled and the Vindicator main vehicle, there isn't really a lot to look out for. It's a fairly sturdy vehicle with not a lot of parts which pop off fairly easily. Except for this rear fan, however, you'll often find this thing removed. But you don't have to look for a specific rear fan because it is the same mold as the ones uh, from the middle of the vehicle. As for the figure, it's really only the face mask which goes missing. I do have to say though, it is a little bit tougher to find the face mask with this figure.
Stay tuned for next week where I'll take a look at the Balforce 2000 Skysweeper, the anti-aircraft tank and its driver knockdown, and the Marauder, the motorcycle tank with its driver, Dodger.